and evacuates Ebola patients. But for this mission, Fleckiger insists on the best plane and the best team. He doesn't even tell his family where he's headed. I didn't tell them exactly where I'd been until the mission was over because it was becoming more and more apparent that this was a, a special mission. I told them I was going to Korea to pick up a patient. I did not say North Korea. At Phoenix Air's headquarters, a second team led by Chief Operator Dent Thompson has to solve a logistical problem. The plane will not be allowed to refuel in Pyongyang. Currently, there are certain sanctions that are in place between the U.S. government and the North Korean government. And for us to pay for anything, we would have to get special permits, which we simply did not have time to do. On the morning of June 10th, 2017, a Saturday, the plane takes off on its mission. Fluckiger is joined by two male nurses and two U.S. State Department representatives. With refueling stops in Montana and Alaska, their flight takes them halfway around the globe to northern Japan, and hopefully on to Pyongyang. The outskirts of Cincinnati, Ohio. Otto Warmbier grew up here in the suburb of Wyoming. At first, his parents don't answer our inquiries. They aren't seeking the spotlight. The town has modest and affluent neighborhoods. Otto Warmbier's father runs a medium-sized business. Otto, the oldest of three children, is the pride of both his family and his high school. At graduation, he holds the commencement address. His future is mapped out. College in Virginia, a scholarship, a planned semester abroad in Hong Kong. But first, a New Year's adventure, North Korea. He books through a Chinese travel agency. Its slogan, we take you to destinations your mother would rather you stay away from. He joins an international group. They have a great time. He's left an indelible mark on me. He was such a lovely lad. And I've spoken to a lot of people who were on the tour and we're all absolutely, absolutely devastated. Every year, the agency touts their dazzling travel highlight in Pyongyang. The alcohol flows freely. The tour guides make sure everyone's in a good mood. Nights are long at Pyongyang's only hotel for foreigners. Otto's group has fun too. It isn't clear whether they also took on the challenge of the forbidden fifth floor, but many tourists have done so in the past. <laughs> it is the staff's floor, with hallways full of propaganda slogans. Nobody. The hotel surveillance center is also located here. Tourists are usually just admonished. They act innocent and run off. This New Year's Eve, however, the cameras capture someone taking a poster from the wall. It is 1.57 a.m. And it is, according to the trial, Otto Warmbier. Instead of leaving North Korea with the others on January 2nd, he's taken into custody. And he had simply had a tap on the shoulder. Two guards took him away. And I sort of laughingly said to him, well, that's the last we'll ever see of you. And because we got on so well, Otto turned around and just chuckled at me. But of course, there was a huge irony in my words that we obviously didn't know what was going to happen, but that was the last time anyone actually saw him. Two months later, 
North Korea's propaganda televises a staged confession. I entirely beg you, people and government of the DPR Korea, for your forgiveness. Please, I have made the worst mistake of my life. But please, I never should have allowed myself to be a lord by the United States administration to commit a crime in this country. A show trial with obviously coerced statements, perhaps in exchange for a pardon. Sixteen days later, Warmbier discovers that his hopes were in vain. He is publicly sentenced to 15 years of hard labor for subversive activities. His condition from this point on remains uncertain. Shortly before takeoff, Dr. Mike Fluckiger is given the few details known about Warmbier's condition. I had one small written note, one paragraph about his condition saying he was in a coma at Pyongyang Friendship Hospital. That's really all I knew except that he had been hospitalized for 15 months. Was Fluckiger worried about the threat of war? Not really, he says. I think I had felt that the relationship between North Korea and the U.S. had been bad for a while. And uh, no, I, I thought if this door had opened to bring Otto Warmbier back, then there had been negotiations to uh, ease things a little bit. In fact, North Korea's sudden diplomatic effort surprises the U.S. negotiators. Mickey Bergman is one of them. Since Warmbier's arrest, he had been trying to gain access to him with the help of UN contacts. Bergman works together with Bill Richardson, former governor of New Mexico and former U.S. ambassador to the UN. Hardly any other team is as experienced in dealing with Pyongyang as they are. In general, the, the only available direct channel that we have are the people that represent North Korea here at the United Nations. Uh, in this case, the individuals are people that know the governor from before, they know me from before. So that's a direct channel. But at the end of the day, they are not decision makers. And if you want to get to a deal, when you want to get to an understanding, uh, you have to be there in person. So the first priority is, okay, how do we get ourselves invited to North Korea to make sure that we can talk to the people who can make decisions about this? It was different in that you knew that Otto Warmbier by the North Koreans was considered something special because he was from the Midwest, he was an attractive young man, he was an all-America boy. You knew this one was special because it got a lot of TV coverage from North Korea, the trial, where the young man was in trauma. He was very upset and he was carried around. and. And you knew that this was a very sensitive time in United States-North Korea relations. So the North Koreans you knew early on would use them as a bargaining chip to get something back from the United States. They always use political prisoners as bargaining chips. They want something in return. Would that be typical that U.S. inmates suffered physical torture or physical violence? The North Koreans are very tough on interrogations, and their prisons are not ideal. Sometimes they make these political prisoners work in the fields, so labor is involved. Do they specifically torture? I don't have any evidence that they do. Uh, do they treat the prisoners well? No. Um, I think where the North Koreans fall short is just in international standards of allowing consular visits. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It depends on the prize of the prisoner that they hold. Yeah. They want to dramatize it as much as they can. Insiders call these contacts between North Korea's UN representatives and people like Richards the New York Channel. For a long time, it's been the only connection between the two countries. Here at the Palm Restaurant, it is kept alive with steak and lobster over meetings that take place every few weeks. 
Mickey Bergman believes he's close to a breakthrough. He's told to come to Pyongyang. We got the invitation, um, and when I went there, even on the plane, on the way, um, I did have that fantasy in, in, in my mind that I'm coming back with Otto. Swedish diplomats also pressure Pyongyang. There is a meeting of diplomats in Oslo, but no progress is made. I was told uh, that, look, don't, don't be disparaged. There's a saying in Korea that it takes a thousand hacks to bring down a tree. And my response was, I hope I don't need to come back again, you know, however more times in order to get it happen, but I get the message. The Kim regime seems to buy time, keen to use warm beer as an asset. Kim won't negotiate until he feels protected by his new nuclear weapons. At the UN General Assembly, North Korea's delegation ignores both the threats and the insults made by the newly elected U.S. president. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. North Korea is still studying Donald Trump's behavior, waiting for new insights. The Obama administration and the North Korean relationship was not good. The policy was strategic patience, more sanctions, more sanctions. The North Koreans, they weren't happy with that, obviously. And they saw in a new administration, well, maybe, you know, we show that we're ready to deal. And, and Otto Warmbier is, is the closest thing to, to a concession. But what was it that convinced Pyongyang to allow ailing Otto Warmbier to be evacuated? Does the regime believe America will be grateful? Or is Warmbier already so weak that they just don't want him to die as their prisoner? Flickiger asks himself the same questions until his crew suffers the first setback. When they reach Sapporo that evening, their flight seems doomed. The local flight control center doesn't have the information it needs. The plane is grounded. They told me that the uh, Japanese air traffic control, because there was no relationship with North Korea, uh, did not want to let us fly directly to North Korea. They would, they would have to send us to another route to a country that they did have a relationship with, and then at that point we would fly in. I called back up to the U.S. Department of State and got a very high-level person on the phone, and I said, here's the situation. Unless you can intercede and resolve this, this trip is over. After nighttime crisis calls with government officials, Japan's prime minister eventually gives the go-ahead. The next morning, Flickiger's plane receives clearance to fly from Sapporo to Pyongyang, a flight route that doesn't officially exist. When the plane was probably 100 miles uh, east of the North Korean boundary, the Japanese air traffic controller said, we're now terminating surf, uh, service. Uh, North Korea is in front of you. Have a nice day. And then turned off the radio. The Pyongyang airport contacts the plane by radio. Hours later on the ground, Flickiger's team is escorted to the building where Warmbier has been hospitalized for months. We were dropped off at the front door of the hospital and accompanied down a hallway up, up the stairs. And uh, when we entered the room, there were two doctors and four nurses. One was the chief of staff of the hospital and one was the doctor who had been in charge of Otto's care during the time that he had been in the hospital. And uh, so uh, they said, you can examine Otto. My first impression was he's not in a coma. He, he was awake, he had his eyes open. He uh, was not responsive, purposefully responsive, but he was reactive to noise and touch and so on, and, and the doctors and nurses confirmed that. Flickiger examines Warmbier, 
asks the doctors more questions. It was a, a standard physical exam. I listened to his heart and lungs, checked his eyes, pupils, uh, did a neurologic exam as best I could. I had what I felt was enough time to examine. That's when I started asking questions. They said, well, oh, let's, let's go out. Uh, you finish your exam, then we'll go out and talk. You must have had also on your mind what happened to make him fall yes. into a condition like right. that. Right, yeah, absolutely. So what did you think? Well, uh, the North Koreans had two possible explanations. One was botulism poisoning, which they could not test for. Uh, they said he had eaten a pork meal the, the, as he, the day he went into prison, and could he have had uh, botulism poisoning, which can cause you to stop breathing, but it would not happen that quickly in general didn't sound very plausible. The other was that they had given him two sedatives on the night he went in because he was very agitated, upset, and uh, that either he had a bad reaction or they gave him too much. They, they said that themselves. Did you have a feeling in North Korea that the doctors were hiding something from you? I certainly was looking for signs of torture. Uh, could, could this be torture? And what I uh, concluded from my physical exam was that I could not see any signs of torture. Uh, I had the feeling they were they were forthcoming with their information and didn't seem that they were hiding anything and uh, we examined all of his skin and found no evidence of any skin breakdown. After a hospitalization of that length that's pretty remarkable so that to me uh, indicated that, that he got Good care, he got attentive care, and uh, yeah, it, it's an indicator. Did you have in mind the parents waiting, not knowing? Was that something that you happened carried the whole, with you? The whole time, the whole time we were there. Since Warmbier's parents still won't talk to us, we talk to people they have been more open with. A two hours drive from New York, we meet one of them. The Warmbiers had turned to him for help early on a former diplomat with Korean experience. We discuss what strategic patience means for the families. Should they remain silent to keep from endangering negotiations or not? During many, many hours of rather emotional conversations that we had on the phone, uh, I began to hear this argument uh, from them and I pushed back against it. Uh, and, and I gave them evidence that, that there were efforts being made, uh, not just efforts by me and, and other civilians, but people in the government. Uh, but I also made the point to them that something was different about the way that Otto's case was uh, being handled, and it made the normal diplomatic intervention uh, that you would expect to work with the North Koreans, it made that ineffective. The Warmbiers have even stopped talking to Otto's school. Month after month goes by with no sign of life from their son. Nobody knows that in faraway North Korea, he was seen from the outset as a prisoner of war with no access to diplomats. Following Trump's inauguration, Warmbier's parents speak out and accuse the Obama administration of failure although they met with his Secretary of State, John Kerry, several times. They confide in Trump's favorite network, Fox News, easy prey for their host's ongoing partisan crusade against Obama's Democrats. Now, John Kerry was Secretary of State at the time. Did you speak to him? We met, we met with, with And what was the outcome of that? A uh, nice guy, <clears throat> nice person. Did he uh, help you in any way? Totally exasperated and overwhelmed with North Korea. Uh huh. Totally. Did he help you in any way? No, absolutely not. Did anyone in the State Department help you in any way? No, no, absolutely not. The first thing after I got the phone call was, did you read the State Department blog, blog or whatever on, North, on North, Korea? North Korea before you let him go? And Wait, someone from the State Department said that to you? Yeah. Oh, in other words, Many blaming times. you for the kidnapping and imprisonment of your son. 
It was your fault. That was the message from the State Department. Right. They acted like we were ignorant, basically, for letting him go. We feel Wait, ignorant. So they judged you and blamed you for your son's kidnapping by the North Korean government. Yes. Like it was your fault. That's what you got when you reached out to the U.S. government for help. Right. You got blame and judgment. And they asked us to stay quiet because they said it's better for everyone involved. Yeah, better for the bureaucrats, because nobody knows how little they're doing when nobody talks about it. Do you have a message for this new State Department, for Secretary Tillerson? What would you like him to do? Sure. I'd like to work with him to bring Otto home. He can make a difference here. He's a doer. It may be disrespectful to ask for that. President Trump, I ask you, bring my son home. You can make a difference here. I pray this is resolved. Thanks a lot for joining us. One thing I know for sure, I, I, I have not been a parent that lost a kid. And that's something that I was talking to Fred and Cindy Wombier throughout, is that those things take time. It doesn't mean that you need to sit back and, and, and trust that the government is doing everything for it because the government has complex sets of interests, um, but it takes time. And on average in North Korea, it's between a year and a half and two years. And in all of the scenarios that I've ever imagined, working on this, and we worked on it for about 18 months, um, I always imagined that it does get resolved and Otto does come home. And I had never imagined in all this time the scenario of what actually ended up happening. What upset me was that it took them a year to admit that he was in a coma. They never told us that. The North Korean contacts we had said that they didn't know either that he was in a coma. That's possible. He was controlled, a young man auto by the security services. And they don't communicate with each other. This is a country of enormous secrecy. Only the top, only the top echelon knows what's going on and they decide who gets the information within their own government. The North Korean doctors hand over their CT scans of Warmbier's brain to Dr. Flückiger. He writes a report, but still, Warmbier is a prisoner. The door opens and here comes a judge in, in a judge's robe. He goes to that same spot I was in and he conducted a, a, a little 10 minute court hearing to commute Otto Warmbier's sentence. So he was still a prisoner. He had to have an official hearing to release him. And then at that point they brought in all of Otto's belongings and uh, they wanted us to go through him piece by piece and check it off. We said, just give us his passport, his wallet, uh, just give us everything. On June 13th, 2017, Otto Warmbier finally leaves North Korea. The vibration and noise of the airplane was, was really difficult for him and it made him stiffen up and almost as if he were having a convulsion. So we gave small doses of some, uh, standard uh, some sedating drugs. The two nurses and I said, talk to each other about how do we want the parents to see him? Do we want him to be fully awake or do we want him to be calm and sedated? And we decided should be calm and sedated. Fluckiger's crew flies home via their planned route until the White House administration's claims of success create another mishap. At the president's direction, the Department of State has secured the release of Otto Warmbier from North Korea. Uh, he is on his way en route home to be reuni reunited with his family. We began to talk with the ground handling people at Cincinnati International, and they said the media was showing up, truck after truck, and it was getting out of control. And we said, look, we highly recommend that we change the arrival airport from Cincinnati International Airport to Lumpkin Regional Airport. Warm Beer's parents and his two younger siblings are waiting outside the hangar. The rescue team decides to give them time on board alone with Otto. We all understood what a terrible situation this was for them. Uh, we escorted them onto the plane. 15 minutes out from the airport, we had given him another dose of the sedative, and he was very calm and quiet. The minute the parents got up there, started talking to him, he woke up. So it was, it was my impression and the nurse's impression that 
yeah, he had some level recognized his parents' voices. Really? Yeah, I think so, yeah. He just immediately woke up and was kind of that, in that agitated state. Uh, it was so hard to watch. Fred Warmbier later describes their reunion. I knelt down by his side and I hugged him and I told him I missed him and I was so glad that he made it home. Since the airport doesn't have the necessary equipment, Warmbier is carried from the plane while his mother and father look on. This will be the last public photograph of him for a long time. She and I firmly believe that he fought to stay alive through the worst that the North Koreans could put him through in order to return to the family and community he loves. But the hope that he recovers is short-lived. He shows no signs of understanding language, responding to verbal commands, or awareness of his surroundings. A week later, the family gives up. They have all life support systems switched off. Otto Warmbier dies. Fred and Cindy Warmbier continue to stay out of the limelight. But when North Korea itself claims to be the victim in the case, they make another appearance on Fox News. They describe Otto's return home in stark terms. Otto had a shaved head, he had a feeding tube coming out of his nose. He, had, he, his, he was staring blankly into space, jerking violently. He was Gosh. blind. He was deaf. As we looked at him and tried to comfort him, it looked like someone had taken a pair of pliers and rearranged his bottom teeth. Oh, my gosh. Within two days of Otto being home, his fever spiked to 104 degrees. He had a large scar on his right foot. North Korea is not a victim. They're terrorists. They destroyed they, him. They, they purposely and intentionally injured Otto. With no evidence, Trump Twitter's great interview, Otto was tortured beyond belief by North Korea. Before, and also with no evidence, a government official had told the New York Times that Otto had been repeatedly beaten. However, neither the hospital nor the coroner we consulted found any evidence of torture. But what was the cause of death? We have evidence that his brain was deprived of oxygen for a length of time significant enough to cause severe anoxic encephalopathy. In other words, brain damage caused by lack of oxygen to the brain has to be at least, at least four minutes. This is an example of what a normal brain looks like. And then this is an example of a brain with changes similar to what Otto had, yeah. where you can see that the ventricles are huge and the rest of the brain tissue is really shrunken, meaning yes. that the entire brain was deprived of oxygen for a significant amount of time. If he was struck here, he might have changes here, yeah. but then he would may also have something called contra-coup injury, which is across the brain yeah. to this side of the head. He yeah. might have changes as well. But what caused the brain injury? Waterboarding, electric shocks, a suicide attempt? All possible, she says, including Pyongyang's own explanation. If they gave him something to sedate him that made him stop breathing for a period of time, a long enough period of time, absolutely. Her specialists also examined the scar on his foot. Their findings were inconclusive. I can't argue with anybody that says, hey, this could have been caused by electrodes. It could have been, but maybe it was something that was placed in the skin that got infected. That could have been, too. So there's nothing specific about that healed scar. What remains is the allegation that warm beer's lower teeth were forcibly twisted. Yet the coroner says there would be signs of trauma. 
This is an example of the changes that he had in his lower teeth. The forensic odontologist looked at it as well and agreed that there was no trauma at all to those roots. And you can't pull teeth out and then rearrange them and put them in different places without there being trauma to the roots. If I had any evidence and concrete evidence that there was a criminal act here, I would be very loud about it and, and would definitely be stating that. Unfortunately, the evidence we have does not point to anything in particular as far as this is what happened to him. At first, the coroner withholds the results out of respect for the mourning family. But in her mailbox, she also found warnings. It felt vaguely threatening and um, that I shouldn't, that I was being disloyal uh, to the president and um, that I shouldn't disagree with the president, especially in such a public way. Efforts to get to the bottom of the warm beer case have resulted in countless files and articles. Much of the information is contradictory. Establishing the truth would also pose a challenge to the federal court in Washington where the warm beers file a lawsuit against North Korea with the help of government-friendly experts and lawyers. Pyongyang does not contest the case, and the trial takes place with the plaintiffs only. And strangely enough, without Flukiger and the coroner appearing as witnesses. One expert witness urges the judge to hand down a spectacular verdict. I replied, I do believe that this case has the potential to go beyond the personal tragedy suffered by the warm beer family and perhaps one day save lives, that is, deter North Korea with the right kind of punitive damages and the judgment that the judge uh, will make. The expert continues making controversial claims, citing the question of Otto Warmbier's teeth, for example. His teeth were in perfect, you know, fine alignment, straight. When he was returned, it was clear that at least two of his lower teeth had been realigned, which is a polite way of saying plucked out and then shoved back in. He also claims that North Korea tortured warm beer to deter the U.S. from military action. But Washington didn't even know of his condition. I can follow that they need a hostage if they provoke the world mm -hmm. as some kind of security issue or asset. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't work if you kill your asset. Mm -hmm. How should that work? Uh, well, whether what no reason do they have to kill the asset? So this is a um, slightly different angle of discussion, very important. But did North Korea intend to kill its victim or not? I don't know for sure. but. That does not matter in the legal case. In the end, the court orders North Korea to pay half a billion dollars, based, among other things, on the president's public confirmation that North Korea tortured Otto. For a while, the warm beers publicly stand by the president, lending their support to his fight against the North Korean dictatorship. After a shameful trial, the dictatorship sentenced Otto to 15 years of hard labor. Otto's wonderful parents, Fred and Cindy Warmbier, are here with us tonight. Please. You are powerful witnesses to a menace that threatens our world, and your strength truly inspires us all. Thank you very much. Thank you. At some point, the North Korean leader clearly decides that his rockets provide the country with sufficient protection. 
Maybe he's spent enough time studying the U.S. president to see he only needs to compliment Trump to get his way. And although Kim refuses to demobilize, Trump starts to praise him like never before. He even exonerates Kim in the Warmbier case. I don't think that uh, the top leadership knew about it. You know, you got a lot of people, a big country, a lot of people. And in those prisons and those camps, you have a lot of people. And some really bad things happened to Otto. Some really, really bad things. Why, why are you But he tells me, he tells me that he didn't know about it. And I will take him at his word. Uh, and, yes, uh, ma'am, go ahead, please. Otto Warmbier has served his purpose. Kim Jong-un is now a friend of Donald Trump. He wrote me beautiful letters. And they're great letters. We fell in love. The Warmbiers are shocked and react in writing. Kim and his evil regime are responsible for the death of our son. No excuses or lavish praise can change that. I had a call and talked to Fred and Cindy just to check in. Every now and then we, we talk a little bit, and that was an important moment because I, I knew that they, uh, they that must have been emotional. Um, it, it's hard for me to explain uh, Donald Trump, President Trump's tactics in this. Um, I am supportive of engagement with North Korea, obviously. That's what we do. Um, I am not a, a fan of the high-wire personal diplomacy because um, it might work on a tactical level, but when it fails, we're on the brink of war. I would hope that he was not trying to use the family. Um, I think he genuinely felt for the family and for Otto, but then his statements about Kim Jong-un, my buddy, and uh, are very disconcerting and, and disappointing. In New York, we soon come across more disturbing details. Allegedly, the official torture claim was controversial from the outset within the Trump administration, says ex-diplomat Evans Revere. He received a call after citing the accusation in a radio broadcast. I merely cited the New York Times story and the fact that a U.S. government official apparently had confirmed that there had been torture. Uh, this made the senior official who called me rather upset. And he made a point of calling me directly and saying that uh, there had been no torture, uh, that uh, Otto came back and it was obvious that he had been well cared for in the hospital, that he didn't have any bed sores or the things that you would normally expect uh, of a, uh, uh, a torture victim to have. I said, I'm not confirming it, I'm not denying it, I'm just repeating what, what he had said. Uh, and he said, well, I just wanted to let you know for the record that uh, there was no torture. We ask in Washington if that's true. The White House doesn't answer. The State Department responds by saying, we won't have a comment on this. When we ask for permission to film Otto Warmbier's grave, his mother agrees to accompany us. Hours later, it's clear she isn't coming. She texts us to cancel the interview. A year later, we meet in Berlin. The Warmbiers now see themselves as international campaigners against North Korea, for Otto's sake. That's Otto and I, we did a tandem bicycle race, and that's Otto playing football, and he loved that. They also show us previously unseen pictures. And that's how Otto looked when we got him home. That's Otto with his mom. They are plagued by more than their loss. They still need clarity. That doesn't just happen. And how... He didn't have any scars on his body. That's, that's, that doesn't just happen. Think about this. A 21-year-old <clears throat> kid who's like I described, works out all the time, eats healthy. How do you end up a vegetable otherwise? And Fluckiger? How does he feel about the mission that both succeeded and failed? Shortly after his return home to Cartersville, Georgia, news channels claim that the U.S. paid North Korea $2 million for hospital costs. 
which is later denied. And North Korea insists that Warm Beer returned home healthy. The North Koreans said they had released Odo in good shape and he died in the U.S. What's your comment on that? Yes, I know. Look at that. They took him back to America and he died in six days. Well, when I read that, I, um, all, all I can do is shake my head, right? Too many lies, he says. And I was only the doctor. 